be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Dale. And I'm sure that no one come out tonight just to be seen. It's a very bad night. God bless your gallant souls for withering this snowstorm to come to hear the word of the Lord. And I trust that after this life is finished, that I will meet you in a place where we won't have to brave snowstorms to, to worship the Lord. Now, I call that real, real Christianity. You don't come out just to be seen on a night like this, or neither for curiosity. And I'm sure that the Lord will bless us in our gathering together tonight. And now, I'm just a little hoarse, and I won't take but just a few minutes of time to speak. And then I will, uh, we will have the prayer line. And now you people that's got your prayer cards, while we're running through these lines of discernment, picking out somewhere a group of few here and there to pray for, hold your prayer card because we're going to pray for all that's got prayer cards. So just keep your prayer card. Let us pray now. Blessed God, it's grateful to thee and the adoration of our hearts go to you when we see people coming through the snow and the slick roads to come to worship thee in the service. It shows, Lord, that the faith of our fathers are living still in spite of dungeons or swords or storms. God's great church marches onward. And we're so happy to be a member of that blessed body, looking shortly for the coming of our blessed Lord, who will receive us up into his kingdom and to his presence. There will we ever be with him. Oh, the glorious thoughts and the joy that sweeps through our souls when we look upon these promises and the Holy Spirit bearing us record that they are true. And then tonight, Lord, speak to us in thy word and heal all the sick and the needy that share. May each of them receive a reward for coming out tonight. If there's any unsaved, may they get that great eternal reward of being saved from their sins. I pray, God, that you'll stop this snow, send the rain and wash it away, that we might have good nights while we're carrying this revival in thy name. Bless our people that's here, our brethren and sisters, your children. As they come to fellowship around the Word, may they be protected on these slick roads tonight. Going to their home, protect them that no harm and danger come to them. Grant it, Lord, and give us a great blessing. Now we're going to open the Word, and no man can open it but you. We can turn the pages back if we're physically able. But Thou alone, Lord, can open the Scriptures to us. Though we would read it many times, it would be hid from our eyes unless Thou would open it. And we pray that You'll open to us the Word, and may we fellowship around it. For we ask it in the name of Thy blessed child, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. In St. Matthew's, the twelfth chapter, just for a little scripture reading, I wish to read the forty-second verse, and then to comment on this just a few moments, and you pray with me. And the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now the tapes that Mr. Gold here and Mr. Mercer have, they take them on the messages, on recordings. They've got hundreds from all over the country. 
The outstanding ones was in Chicago just re- recently. There's a, a group of five of them. A few people want them for recording. Are your recorders? We had a real good PA system, and every word was clear. And then uh, they had them, and they sell them just as cheap as they possibly can. I ordered one from a certain evangelist not long ago, and I paid nine dollars for the tape. The boys, I think, it's about three dollars for them, and. Cheaper than that, I think, if you buy them in a group. Just about what the tape, a little more than the tape is worth, what they had to pay for it by buying them by the hundreds of dollars worth at a time. So you can see my associate here, Mr. Gold or Mr. Mercer, they'd be glad to take care of it for you. <clears throat> the reading of the scriptures tonight, we have read just a portion of the infallible word of the eternal God. And Jesus had just been upbraiding them because of their hardness of their heart, because they had not believed him. Then we find that he, back in the former part of the scriptures, they had, in this same text or uh, chapter, they had called him Beelzebub because he was doing the supernatural sign. And if anyone knew, that God always dwells in supernatural because God himself is supernatural. And his children, which are his offspring, is the nature of their father. They also believe in the supernatural. Hallelujah. So if they cannot believe in the supernatural, then the Spirit of God is not in them, dominating their life. These great cultured Man, those days, the priests and the rabbis and the Pharisees, which were very highly cultured men, fine educated scholars, know the word, just the letter, and they had to live unspotted lives. Because he that despised Moses' law died under two or three witnesses. And they would be stoned if they did anything wrong. So they must be a selected group a scholarly group, an educated group. But God doesn't dwell in any of that. God dwells in humility, in an honest heart, such as we're receiving. And these men had just said, now notice, if, when you go home tonight, read this 12th chapter of St. John. And you'll see that these Pharisees never come right out and told Jesus that he was Beelzebub, but they thought it in their hearts, and he knew their thoughts. He perceived what they were thinking about. And they said in themselves, this man is Beelzebub. And Jesus straightway was condemning them for their evil thinking. And he went ahead to get say of the great signs that had been in the earth. And he referred previous to this to the prophet Jonah. And he said, we would seek a sign from the rabbi. And he said, a weak and adulterous generation will seek after a sign. And there will be no sign given them, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now let's stop just a little bit on Jonah. Now, Jonah had received a commission from God to go to Nineveh. And there's nothing just providential. All God's great wheels turn perfect. Everything is working just exactly the way he has knows that it would work. Nothing is as providential. It so happened. God is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows all things and has all power. Then, as Jonah went on his road, he over to Nineveh, or to Tarsha, rather, trying to find an easier way because it seemed like the ship was going that way, so maybe the Lord just would send him to this place, to Tarsha, instead of Nineveh. He thought maybe that's the way God worked. 
God don't always work on the easy road and things that's at your hand. You have to struggle to do the will of God sometimes. So then, we find our prophet then, tonight, as he got on the ship and there come a great uproar of the sea. And they tied his feet and his hands and threw him out of the ship. God had a great big fish prepared for him. And he swallowed the preacher. And there, after the fish feeds, anyone knows that when a fish feeds, he goes to the bottom and rests himself with his swimmers against the bottom of the lake or the brook or the sea or whatever he's in. Feed your little goldfish and watch them. Just as soon as they got their little belly full, they'll go right down in the bottom of the jar and there they'll rest. Well, this stormy sea and this prophet backslidden, hands tied behind him, feet tied in the belly of the whale in the bottom of the ocean. I've always thought of this when I see people that look to symptoms. If there ever was a person who had a right to have symptoms, it was Jonah. Look at his condition. There's no one in that condition here tonight. And he, had, he was backslid, out of the will of God, feet and hands tied, in the bed of the whale, vomit all over him, seaweeds around his neck, laying in the bottom of the sea. If he looked this away, it was the whale's belly. If he looked this away, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked, it was whale's belly. Now, there's none of us that bad off. And you know what he said? He refused to see the whale's belly. He said, they are lying symptoms, lying vanities. Watch what that man said down in that condition. He refused to see his circumstance. And he said, once more will I look towards thy holy temple. Oh, if we could only see that. And Jonah knew that when Solomon dedicated that temple, he said, Lord, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and will look towards this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And Jonah based his confidence in the prayer of Solomon. And under those circumstances, and if Jonah under those circumstances could base his faith in a prayer of a man that was an earthly man that later backslid and to an earthly temple which was tore down, how much more ought we tonight, under the little circumstances that we have, to look to the temple where Jesus sits at the right hand of God with his own blood to make intercession upon our confession. Yes, at the right hand of God to make intercessions. Why, our little symptoms means nothing. Oh, how God wants us to look at what he said. Abraham took God at his word and called those things which were as though they were not as though they were because God said so. Just kept believing it. Oh, if we could only look away from these little afflictions, the little light things that we have, these little ups and downs and troubles, they are so little and insignificant. Sometimes they're put on us to try our faith. Now, we'll notice that if you ever read the history of Nineveh, they were a greater city or a bigger city than St. Louis is now. Over a million population, I guess, and around about in Nineveh. They were so illiterate till they didn't know right from left hand. And they worshipped idols. And when their sea god was the whale, and you see how God had to get that message to them? The whale swallowed Jonah and kept him in his belly for three days and nights. And when all the fishermen was down there at the sea, the God vomit the prophet up on the bank. Sure they would hear his message. Supernatural. Because the God of the sea had sent forth his prophet to preach. And they believed the message. 
And Jesus said that will be like manner that a weak and adulterous generation, which we are now living in, as the sign of Jonah, so would it be now. And you notice that the sign that he was going to give to the weak and adulterous generation was a sign of the resurrection. The resurrected Lord Jesus, that the earth had to let him loose on the third morning, and he's raised from the dead and is alive tonight, right here in our midst, to do the works of God among us. How glorious is the word of the living God. Then he says, And the queen of the south shall rise up in the last days with this generation and condemn it because she came from the utmost parts of the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, I say unto you, a greater than Solomon is here. Now God in all generations has had his servant and his prophet or his message somewhere in the earth going at all times. God has never been without a witness. And in every generation, they receive the witness of God. And then if the people receive that witness, then that is a golden age for that generation. If they turn that witness down, then it is a dark age for that generation. Now, God had done a great thing in the days of Solomon. And we all know as readers of the blessed word that that age of Solomon was considered the golden age of Israel. They built the temple. The whole world paid them tribute. And the reign of Solomon, which was a foreshadow of Christ, the son of David. And notice, God gave Solomon Solomon, a gift of discernment. And all of the nation, the entire economy of Israel, all believed that with one accord. Everywhere, every place, on every lip, oh, God has visited us with a great gift. And that's the reason the nation prospered. Now, would it not be great today if we, the people of God, would accept the gift of God that He sent us, that is the Holy Ghost? If we would only with one accord, if this whole nation would accept Christ, the Holy Ghost, the gift that God has sent us, and there would be no denominational barriers between us. And we'd be one heart and one accord. I'd say, brother, it would be better protection than all of the bombs that any scientists could create. We would be, have a protection. And our protection would be made out of feathers. For under his wings, we would be abiding just as safely as we could be. If the nation would just accept it. But how can we get the message across when we're all divided and in different notions and guns trained on each other? And, and that's what makes it hard. Amen. Now, we notice that when that began to take place and the entire church began to testify and accept and believe with all their hearts in that great gift that God had sent them. Why, certainly the other nations begin to hear of it. And away down across the Sahara Desert, way down into Ethiopia, the Queen of Sheba, she lived in the utmost parts of the known world of that day. And no doubt this little pagan queen down there now, she was not a believer. She was a pagan. And when she was, everyone would come by and hear of this great gift that was up in Israel and Palestine. 
They would go down, and the passerby would tell in all different parts of the country, Oh, you should be up in Palestine. They're all united with one heart and one accord. And their God has sent them a great gift. And God has made that man the king. And with one accord, they all believe. Oh, wouldn't that be a real example for the church today? Just one accord. They're all in one accord. And oh, their God is performing miracles. Isn't that a rebuke to us today as a nation and as a church? Their God is doing great things among them. And you know, every time somebody would come by from up that way, they would tell that to the little queen. Now, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the words of God. And you know, when you really begin to speak of the supernatural and of a God who still lives, there's something about it in every man's heart that has any spirituality at all. He longs to see behind that curtain. Amen. Every man is it because inside of him, he's a supernatural being. He's got a, a spirit that motivizes him, that makes him to move and to talk and to think. And he is a supernatural being. And this little woman being a queen, she begins to draw up a lot of enthusiasm. For everybody was telling the same thing. That's the way we want to do it. All speak the same. Glorifying God. Not one say, well, I'm a Baptist. We don't cooperate with such. Uh -oh. oh, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm not Pentecostal. It don't make any difference what it is, what denomination, what tag they're wearing. If you're son and daughter of God, you can't keep away from it. That's right. I used to do a lot of riding. My father was a rider. I'm not much of a rider, but I've done a lot of ranch work. Do my life. I used to work on the old tripod, which you'll go hunting on now many times in Colorado. In the springtime when we'd ride out there with the cattle, they had the drift fence coming down the Repertoire Forest, and we heard the, the Hereford Association graze the Troublesome River Valley. That's between Bertha Pass and Rabbit Air Pass. You could catch it on 40, Troublesome River. And way up about 25 miles up there, our ranch is at the head of the river. And all the association would drive their cattle up there in the springtime. If you could raise as much as a ton of hay, you could put a cow on the forest. That was the quota from the Chamber of Commerce. And you had to have it brand. And a many day I've sat there with my, after riding for days, getting the cattle up to the drift fence, and watched the ranger standing there as he counted them and marked them as they went through. And I sat there and I watched the diamond T go across. I watched the lazy R cross. Our tripod, the turkey track just below us. And I noticed, sitting there with my leg across the horn of the saddle, as they passed that drift fence, the ranger wasn't too much concerned about what kind of a brand they had on them. Because they'd done been checked on that. But he was concerned about what kind of a blood they had in them. They'll think you get in there but a third bread Hereford. Nothing else. A blood tag is what counted the last case. And I think that's the way it will be at the end of time. God won't look for whether we are oneness or twoness or threeness or fiveness or whatever we are. It'll be the blood of Jesus Christ. God says he'll look for that blood sign at the end of the journey. Oh, if we could just be in one accord and respect the gift that God has given us. Then we notice also that after that little faith got built up and someone else testified, some travelers said, oh, you should see the great miracle working. You know, I believe that Israel has a true God up there because all of our idols, they don't speak. We've got a lot of theology, 
but there's nothing in it. No matter how good the theology is, if it don't speak back, a God of history is no good if he isn't the same today. What good does it do to feed your canary bird all kinds of vitamins to make it have good wings and then keep it in the cage all the time? It doesn't do any good. What we want to be is free. Get out so we can spread our wings. Our wings of faith in the power of the resurrected Christ and soar about this carrying on here on earth. And we notice then they begin to create a desire. So finally she said, all this that I've been hearing, I believe I'll go up and find out for myself. That's the good way. Don't sit across and say, well, my church isn't cooperating. Go anyhow. She did. She was on her own. Whether they were Pentecostal or, or Presbyterian, it didn't make any difference to her. Her heart was hungry because God wasn't leading her. And sons and daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. Notice this little woman. Now, being a woman, she had a lot of difficult before her. Now she said, I'm going to take enough food and so forth to stay, and I'm not going up there just for one night and hear the preacher preach, and if I don't like what he says tomorrow night, I won't go back. She was going to stay till she was convinced. That's the way to do it. Stay till she was satisfied. She was going to examine it by the Scriptures. And see whether that gift was right or not. And notice, she said, if it is right, I'm going to support it. She took a lot of gold and frankincense. She was going to do something about it. If it was real, it was worth something. If it wasn't, she's going to bring her gold back. <laughs> That's the way to do it. The truth. Now, I'm not plugging for offerings for our churches and things. I'm just telling you that it's not only worth... It's not only worth your money, it's worth your time and your life and your devotion and everything that you are. Amen. If it's right. Your testimony. All that you are, it's worth every bit of it because it costs what he had to bring it to you. Now, she got ready. Now, the first thing, she was a woman. Now, she had to cross a desert. Mark the time. You know how long it's taken a camel to cross from, from where her palace was to Solomon's palace? It taken three months. Three months. Not in an air-conditioned Cadillac, but on the back of a camel. Through the hot sun. Oh, my, and some here in America won't walk across the street to see it. They're not concerned. But she was. Something was digging at her heart. Oh, God knows his own. All that he foreknew, he's called. All that he called, he justified. All that he has justified, he has glorified. No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. <laughs> so you see, the gospel can be preached in the power and the demonstration of the resurrection, and people's hearts can be so hard that they're not even concerned anymore. Amen. See the condition of the day we're living in? But that's where we're living. I'm saying this because I appreciate tonight your sacrifice, not through a desert, but through a slick streets and over roads for hundreds of miles. It shows that God still draws the people. They come regardless. Weather doesn't stop them. And she came. And she, another thing she had to do, Remember, she being a woman and laden down with gold. And the sons of Ishmael was in the desert and they were robbers. What, an, what a setup that would have been for them. 
a little woman with a few guards around her, sitting on the back of a camel, perhaps had to travel mostly by night because the desert is so hot in the daytime. No water, just what she could pack on the camels. Oh, she had a lot to confront, but she was determined. And if a man or a woman is determined, God will go with them and see that it comes to pass and they get their desire. Hallelujah. If something is thirsty, if the deep calls to the deep, there's got to be a deep to respond to it. Before there's a fin on a fish's back, there had to be a water for him to swim in first. Before there was a tree to grow in the earth, there had to be an earth first for it to grow into. I read some time ago where a little boy eat the racers off of pencils in school. Then his mammy caught him eating the pedal off of a bicycle. And she took him down to the clinic. And when they examined the little fella, he needed sulfur. Sulfur is found in rubber. Now, before there could be a crave for sulfur, there had to be a sulfur somewhere to respond to that crave. And as long as you're willing to drive through a snowstorm to come to Christ to be healed, there's got to be a fountain open somewhere. As long as you crave, as long as this church craves for more of God, there's more of God somewhere to respond to that crave. The deep, calling to the deep, as David said, at the noise of thy water spout. The deep calling. Before the deep can call, there's got to be a deep to respond to that call or there'd be no call. So if there wasn't a Bible to tell me that Christ healed to see you here tonight under these conditions, I'd still say there's a fountain open somewhere. Certainly. Hallelujah. That little queen that desired to know a living God, there was a living God somewhere for her to find. No matter what the circumstances were, she was going to do it anyhow. She put all the materials on the camels, the spice, marrow, frankincense, and the great costly things that cost literally thousands times ten thousands of dollars. Today you couldn't buy them for the many, many times more than you would have got then. It cost them the millions to get it. But she laid in her animals and she got her little caravan started. And as she started off across the desert, all them circumstances, but yet something in her heart was pulling her. Oh, if that is the truth. Now she's on her road, but is it the truth? So when she arrived, she didn't come just to stay an hour. She took her camels and put them away and put up her tents and whatever she had, held her gifts to herself. She went into the church. That morning when Solomon took the pulpit and they began to bring the cases up to him, she marveled at that great spirit of discernment. But she said, I'll come back tomorrow when he's sitting. And she stayed. And day after day she watched it without one failure. God can do anything but fail. She watched it, how perfect it was. And then when she was thoroughly convinced in her heart, being a pagan, she was thoroughly convinced that there was a God who lived, not an idol, but a living God, because he was working in his living creature, showing himself that he was God. And she said, all that I have heard was right, and more than I heard is right. She was thoroughly convinced. She gave her gold, she gave her gifts to support it and to build in the temple of God and to do everything that she could do to support it. And Jesus said, she'll rise up in the judgment with you well-trained Pharisees and condemn you. Amen. I feel religious right now. I don't think it's bad to shout. You know? uh, yeah. She'll rise. She'll stand up in the day of the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, a gift of wisdom, discernment, 
And verily I say unto you that a greater than Solomon is yet. And tonight, when they just called him Beelzebub, he said, I'll forgive you for it. But when the Holy Ghost has come and does it, there'll never be forgiveness for that. So I say that Jesus, after his death, burial, and resurrection, his power is stronger and more persuading tonight than it was back there in that day. So what would she do to this generation? For this is God's last call, sending the Holy Ghost into the church to call his people. It's God's last call. She wasn't scared. She didn't care what the presbyters was going to say when she got back, what the bishops and all of them was going to say. She stood publicly and she said, all that I heard is the truth and more than I heard is the truth. She stood for God and she supported the thing and she stands today immortal with the words of Jesus Christ that says when she rises on the scene in the resurrection her obedience to God will condemn that generation. For she stood for what was right when God had sent his gift to the earth and it was being manifested. She came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Some time ago, across the Central America, here there's a, a minister by the name of, of Daniel Greenfield. And he went to sleep one night and he dreamed. And he dreamed that he died. And he was taken up to the gates of paradise. And when he knocked at the door, the doorkeeper came, said, Who art thou that desires to enter these gates? He said, I'm uh, Danny Greenfield. said, I am the, uh, the American evangelist. said, Just a moment, sir. I will see if I can find any record of you here. He came back and he said, there's no record here of you. Oh, he said, there must be something wrong. Surely my record is there. No, there's no record here. He said, well, what shall I do? He said, there's only one thing that you can do you, if you wish to. You can appeal your case to the white throne judgment if you wish to appeal your case. And he said, well, if that's all I can do, I will do it. So he said he began to move out through space. He said it seemed for some time he traveled just in space. And after a while he'd come into what began to get light. Lighter, lighter. And as it lighter it got slower he began to move. And finally, right in the center of this light, he stopped. There was no certain place it was coming from. But just all around him, extreme light. Just many times stronger and more brighter than the sun. And he said, he looked around, and after a while, a great, deep voice said, Who art thou that stands before my judgment? And he said, I'm Daniel Greenfield, the American evangelist. I came to the gates of paradise, and I was asked to come here to your judgment seat to have my case pleaded. That the voice came back and said, Very well, Daniel Greenfield. I will try you at my judgment seat. And he said, I have a law that you must be tried by. Said, Daniel Greenfield, did you ever tell a lie while you was on earth? He said, I thought I'd been a truthful man. But in the presence of that light, he said, I've seen a lot of things that I'd said that wasn't right. And he said, yes, Lord, I lied. He said, Daniel Greenfield, did you ever steal while you were on earth? And he said, if anything I thought I'd been, I'd been honest. But said, in the presence of that great light, I've seen a many a little shady deal I pulled. Listen, friend. You might think you're all right now, but in the presence of that light, it'll be different. It'll certainly be different. You might be a good church member. You might dress good. You might help the poor. That might be all right, but oh, in the presence of that light, 
that white throne judgment. And then the voice said, Daniel Greenfield, was you perfect in your life? Oh, he said, no, Lord, I wasn't perfect. And said he was listening for a great blast to come from the somewhere and said, then depart from me. Then his bones begin to come unjointed, as it were. And he was trembling, knowing that he would sink into a devil's hell in a few minutes to be there for eternity. And said, while he was thinking that and listening for the voice, he said, I heard a voice behind me. It was the sweetest voice I ever heard in all my life. He said it was sweeter than any mother's voice that I ever heard. And said, when I turned, I seen the sweetest face I ever saw. And said he put his arm around me. And he said, Father, that's true. Daniel Greenfield wasn't perfect in his life. But there's one thing he did. When my glory was made known, Daniel Greenfield stood for me on earth. Now I'll stand for him up here. Oh God, let that be my plea tonight. Let me stand for him like the Queen of Sheba did in the face of critics. Let me take my position and stand for him. For on that day, no merit will I have. I'll trust in his alone. If you were going tonight, who would stand for you there? Let us think of that just a moment while we bow our heads. Sinner friend, would Jesus stand for you tonight? Backslider, your church member that's never received God's gift, the Holy Ghost, and you're ashamed of it because your church don't teach it, if you're ashamed of me before man, him will I be ashamed before my Father and the holy angels. Don't you never try to stand by the teachings of a mortal man? Don't you never try to stand with that spirit that you have? It's condemned from the Garden of Eden. It's not a facelifting the church needs. It needs a birth. You must be born again. And if you haven't received that blessing of being born again and know that you've passed from death unto life, I wonder if you just, with your heads bowed, if you just raise your hand and say, Christ, by this, I promise by your grace I'll stand for you from this night henceforth. Would you raise your hand? Any word in the building? God bless you, lady. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you back there. Up in the balcony, along the rows back there, in the bleachers. Someone up there, just raise your hand. Say, Brother Branham, pray for me. We have to cut this short now because it's time to start the prayer line. But I'd just like to see if someone would raise your hand, some more rather, and say, I haven't lived the right life. God bless you, sir. I know that I've, I've seen them many times I took down when an altar stood for Jesus. I took the place of the Pharisee, a religious person, one day said, Take away this man and give us Barabbas. The man who had done nothing but fill the country with love and signs and miracles and wonders. But away with him. When they voted for this revival, I actually put my hand against it. But now I'm going to change it. I'm going to raise my hand to God and say, Be merciful to me. God bless those little fellows up there, 10, 12-year-old children, just at the turning spot. All right. Someone else, just raise your hand and say, Remember me, Brother Pam. You say, Does that do any good to raise my hand? Absolutely. God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. That's right. What does it do? It changes from death to life, if you mean it. God bless you, sir, over here. I see you, too. You, lady, way to the left. God bless you back there at the back of the bleachers. You next, sir, right down the line there. God sees you. What does it mean? What did Jesus say? He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me 
hath everlasting life, and shall not come into the judgment, but pass in death to life. What does holding my hand up do, Brother Branham? Well, we got a, a science that tells us that gravitation holds your hand down. There's no possible way to scientifically prove that your hand can raise up according to gravitation. That's what keeps you on earth. Gravitation holds you here. It holds your hand down. What made your hand go up? It goes to show that there's something in you, a spirit of life, that's made a decision. And you know that you're wrong because a spirit of God has spoke to you. And you raise your hand towards your Creator to recognize that you're wrong and ask for His mercy. You defy every law of science right there. You break the law of gravitation because there's a supernatural something in you that causes you to raise your hand and make a decision for Christ. Would you do it someone else that hasn't done it just before we pray? God bless you back there, sister. God bless you here, my brother. God bless you in the balconies. Yes, that's right, up in there and along the road. God sees your hands, brother, sister. Certainly he does. Will you stand by doing that? You're standing for Christ. And you raise your hand, you fully declare to God that you're sincere. And what is it? A spirit right by you, over you, talking to you, saying, What have you done for me? What if you die in a heart attack tonight? What if you're laying on your pillow and you wake up and you feel your hands getting cold? You scream for the doctor. He comes, says, It's a heart attack. He's gone. And you feel your pulse getting icy. Wife, mother, babies, whoever it is, screaming over you. Then you refuse to stand for Christ. He's going to stand for you then. Oh, my beloved friend, stand for him. Make your stand now, Galilee. And yes, Lord Jesus, I now take my stand on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is Satan stand. I know I've never been born again. I know I haven't never met peace with Christ. And I want to do it now. And God be merciful to me. That's good. God bless you. Let us pray. Dear God, who brought again the Lord Jesus from the resurrection and appearing to us here nightly, showing us that the sign that he promised as Jonah was in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of God be in the heart of the earth. Or Jonah in the belly of the whale, the Son of God in the heart of the earth. He's raised from the dead. He's here now. Be merciful to us, Lord. We love you, and we're your children. And many hands has went up. You said your own words. No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that comes to me, I'll give them eternal life, and will raise them up at the last day. That's your word, Jesus. Now, the preaching of the gospel, that's the trophies of the message. They have raised their hands. And now God, who called them and drawed them, is presenting them now to His Son as love gifts. Now they become the love gifts of God to His Son to be the members of His church. Fill them with the Holy Ghost, Lord. Pour out upon them Thy divine Spirit. Make them gallant soldiers to stand for You here in this present day. And I'm sure in the life that is to come, You'll stand for them when death's cold river comes before them, and the waves of old Jordan begins to dash against your soul, they can scream at the bank, send out the lifeboat, Father, and two glossy wings of the Holy Ghost will come down over the stormy Jordan and bear their souls into the kingdom of God, crossing by the way of the cross. God grant it just now, I present them to you as the fruits of the message, in Jesus' name, Amen. Give a sister a little card. There is a fountain filled with blood. Oh, wait, let's change that. My faith looks up to thee. Would you give us that card? How many knows that old song? Now, how many feels real good? Don't just scour it out. Feel the Holy Spirit just been in here and just scour us out. Do you feel good? Just raise up your hand. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, if just preaching is all we have, we have to wonder but God is here to confirm exactly what He's promised. All right, my faith looks up to thee. One verse. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior, divine now. Why I pray, take all my sins away.
I'll real quietly just hum it, just raise our hand up. Oh, I'll life dark me, I tread. Mm, grief around me spread. Be thou my God. Bid darkness turn to day. Why sorrow tears away? No, let me ever stray from thee. The word has gone forth, and now, Lord God, thou dost never leave a generation without your supernatural works. And these young Christians, some twenty-five or thirty, raised their hands. They needed mercy. And I pray, God, that these people tonight, as soon as the service is closed, will walk up to these cooperating ministers here, shake their hands, and say, Pastor, I want to come to your church. I want to be baptized. I want to take my stand in your flock. And I want to stand there and, and be a gallant soldier to Christ as long as life is in my body. Grant it, Lord. Now, maybe this is their first time to be in the meeting. They don't, maybe has never seen that you still give gifts and you've given us the Holy Ghost in this last day. And he promised the thing of the resurrection. Now, Holy God, grant that these Christians will be privileged tonight to see the power of the resurrected Jesus. Grant it, Lord, that they might go back like the Queen of Sheba. After they made their stand, and after she had made her stand, back across that desert she went. Oh, it seemed, no doubt, a lot shorter going back. Oh, she was so happy. The camels walked different. All of them were singing hymns to Jehovah. Things had changed. The desert wasn't half so hot. Grant, Lord, on their road across the icy streets and roads tonight, it'll be the same thing. May they rejoice as they go along, knowing they pass from death unto life and have seen the resurrected Jesus, the sign to a weak and adulterous generation. Grant it, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hmm. Well, excellent. What was it last time? H. They gave X's tonight. Prayer card X. Last night was H's. Tonight's X. Hold your H's now. We'll get you up here just as quick as we can. But we get a group of cards out. We're waiting for the weather to get a nice group in here and everything so we can start really having the regular prayer lines the way we want to have them. Now, now we're just holding on. How many has never been in one of the meetings before? Let's see your hands. How many has never been in one of my meetings? Just look. Um... I do not claim to be a healer, my Christian friend. I am not a healer. But here's my contention. That I contend that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He raised from the dead. He's not dead. He's alive. And when he was here on earth, the works that he did, he promised he would do again in the last days. He that believeth on me the works that I do, St. John 14, 7. He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he also. He said, a little while in the world sees me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. The works that I do. What kind of works did he do? He said, he did not heal people. How many knows that? It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. And the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. That's the reason when he went and got Nathaniel and brought him to him, the Jew, he told, uh, Philip went and got him, he said, Found him under a tree, and he said, Come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Could any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, Come see. Maybe that's what, maybe the sinners thought tonight, I'll go see. I'll find out. That's the best way to do it. Come find out. And when Philip, on the road back, had told him what, no doubt, but what, when Peter come, which was, first he wasn't Peter, he was Andrew, and, uh, or Simon, rather. And then when he, on his road, he's Andrew's brother. 
And when he'd come up to him, he'd never seen him before, he said, your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Cephas, which is Peter, a little stone. And he said, your father is Jonas. That startled him. That was Jesus yesterday. He's got to be Jesus today if he's the same. Is that right? All right. Then this Philip of the same city of Bethesda went over and found his friend. And his name is Nathaniel. He said, come see who found. He was under a tree praying when he found him. He said, come see who found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. On the road around, he no doubt told him what had been taking place. When he walked up in front of Jesus, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. And he could have been an Arab. He could have been a Greek. They all dressed the same. Turban and robe. But he said, You're an Israelite in whom is no God. He said, Rabbi, when, how did you know me? Whence knowest thou me? And he said, Before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. Thirty miles around the mountain. Hallelujah. That was Jesus yesterday. What did this Jew say, this real true Jew? He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, because I told you that, you believe? What did the Jew say, the real orthodox stiffy? He said, he's Beelzebub, a fortune teller, a devil. Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost has come and does the same thing, it'll never be forgiven you to speak against it. It's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. When he met the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, Woman, bring me a drink. She said, The well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. It's not customary for you Jews to ask us Samaritans that. They had a law of segregation like it is in parts of the South for the colored and white. A law of segregation. We had no dealings with one another. He said, But if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I give you water. You don't come here to drink. The conversation went on. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. And when he found out what her trouble was, how many knows what her trouble was? She is living with five husbands. And he said, uh, go get your husband to come here. She said, I don't have any. He said, that's right, you've got five. And the one you have now is not your husband. Now watch what she said. Sir, you're a Beelzebub. No. That's a telepathy. No. What was it? She was looking for something to happen. She knew the time was at hand. She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. She said, We, we Samaritans know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. He'll tell us these things. But she didn't know who he was. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me what I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? But remember, he never done that before any Gentile. And he told his disciples, Don't go to the Gentiles. Why? This is their age. That was the closing of the Jew. That was the last sign that the Jews received. How many know that? The Jew and Samaritan. And this is the last sign to the Gentile. We're to end road. God gives my throat a little better. I want to try to preach a little this week, if God willing. But my throat gets so I can. All right. We're at the end time now. I want to talk on that at the end time. Maybe Sunday afternoon or some night. Now be reverent. Now... Jesus said, when, uh, in St. John 5, 19, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. Was that the truth? Amen. Could he lie? Not and be the Son of God. The Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. So then, Jesus told the truth then. He had to tell the truth. He was the Son of God. So he never did one miracle until God showed him first what to do. How many knows that's the truth? Not one miracle until God showed him first what to do. Now, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, then to declare himself in this generation, he's got to do the same in order to be the same. Is that right? How many believe that? Now raise up your hand. Now, do you young converts and do you newcomers, if Jesus will appear here on the scene and will do the same thing that he did back there, in them days, to prove that we're at the end of the age and never through the age has it ever been till now. I ask any historian to bring me the history. Never has it been until this age, right now, in the last few years, last five or six years. Never has he done it. Never. A woman touched his garment and he said, who touched me? He couldn't feel it. Well, yeah, 
the Palestinian garment has an underneath garment and a loose robe, and she touched his, the border of his robe, which hung that far from his legs. So who touched me? Well, Peter rebuked him, said, everyone is touching you. He said, but I got weak. Virtue's gone from me. And he looked around until he found the woman, and he told her what her trouble was, and said, and her faith had healed her. How many knows that? How many knows that the Hebrew book says that Jesus Christ is a high priest today, today, that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? How would he act? We, he's the vine, we're the branches. The vine doesn't bear fruit, the branches does. The church is the fruit barriers today. See, my hand is his hands, your hands is his hands. Your eyes and my eyes is his eyes. He just uses us as yielded branches. Father God, the rest is yours now. Let it be known tonight that you're the Son of God that's raised from the dead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see, we, I believe in, what was that H last night? In X tonight. All right, we went up around 20 or 25 last night, I think, didn't we, in the line? Let's start from 25 tonight. X 25. We just start from anywhere, doesn't matter. Who's got X 25? Look at your card now. You got a, a lady over there, would you come right here, sister? 25, 26. X 26, would you raise your hand right quick? Look at your card, your neighbor, someone... If one of the ushers will watch this lady here, maybe she couldn't raise her hand. She's in a wheelchair. All right. X-26, raise your hand quickly. And, all right, 26, 27, that's right. Raise your hand so I can see you right quick. Now, 27, so we can out of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Now, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Be just as reverent as you can. Don't move around. Sit real still. How many doesn't have a prayer card and you want God to heal you? Raise your hand. Say, raise your hand so I'll see where you're at. All right? Now you do this. That's in every section and in everywhere. You just look to God and say, Lord God, if that man's told me the truth, speak to me. I believe that you're the high priest that sits at the right hand of God. And I believe that you can be touched by the feeling of my infirmities. And if you are the same yesterday, if you're ever doing that in the prayer line, then you've got to be the same to speak to me. Now, I look to you, and by faith, I believe that I touch your garment. And now, if you are, and you're now the vine, and we are your branches, then speak to Brother Branham and have him call me. I challenge your faith in Christ's name to do that and see if he does. It's nothing. It's a scripture. How many knows all that scripture? Certainly it is. A promise of God. Now... If the engineer will watch, I know this microphone is not too loud, and I don't know when a, a vision comes, you're in another world. You don't even, you're, you're, I don't know what I say myself. I just have to say it while I'm looking. When I come out of the vision, that's the reason I don't take too many, because you can't tell whether it's vision or not, see? And you don't know which. But just be reverent. I've seen it many as 50 come through at a time. If the faith is good, I don't talk too much for them, just let them pass through. But now here... Uh, how many in here are strangers to me that I don't know? Raise your hands. Everybody that knows I don't know you. Well, it's 100%. You had up your hand too, lady? All right, then we're strangers to one another. Now, here is a woman and a man. Now, to you people here, let's just take our time now for about, we got 15 minutes to get let out on time. Now, look, this is our first time meeting. I've never seen you in my life, and perhaps this is our first time meeting. If that's right, would you just raise your hand? Now, I want you to watch the audience. When you really strike a real believer, watch the expression on their face as soon as that anointing hits them. How many have seen the picture, have you showed it yet, of the angel of the Lord? Let's see your hands now. Yeah, it's here now. And remember, that's vindicated by the FBI, the head of it. Now that's the angel of the Lord that I've been... If, I, if this is my last sermon to preach, if this is my last time to appear in public... There's millions of the people of the church knows that's the truth. And the scientific world can't deny it because it's scientifically proved. My words has been the truth. Because God has vindicated with his church and has vindicated to the scientific world. In Germany, they've taken three pictures, taken a big camera and sat there and asked if they could take it. When the anointing come down, it did it. did the same thing in Switzerland. Like a great big pictures of it. They got them as high as this platform here. Through Germany. You know how many come to the Lord that... that a meeting I had there, 50,000 in five nights in Germany. That's communist too, the most of them. 
communists are communists because the church let down. Exactly. They'll worship a real God, but he has to be real. I don't blame them. That's right. If God's God, let him be God. If it isn't, then we're no better off to be a Mohammed, be a Buddha, anything. Let's leave the real God. Now, here's a picture. Now, if Christ remains the same, which is a the theme of my, my campaigns, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's a woman, and both of us, I don't know whether she's a Christian or not. I suppose she is. She's standing here for something. She might be a critic. She might be a hypocrite. She might be an infidel. She might be sick and needy. She may be a saint of God. I don't know. This is our first time meeting. But if the Holy Spirit will reveal to this woman, like he did the woman at the well, what she's here for, and if she's a critic, watch what happens to her. Just watch her. How many has been in the meetings when you've seen critics come? They're sitting paralyzed, insane, and everything else. See? All right. Now watch what takes place. The God of heaven still lives. Now, I hold my hands. I don't know the woman. This is our first time meeting. She did the same. She don't know me. Now, if this is ain't like the woman at the well, only we're both uh, Anglo-Saxon people, white people, but a woman and a man, the same thing. Now, if I'd speak to her just a moment and tell her, well, I'd say, woman, you're sick, you're going to get well, go on. She'd have a right to doubt that. But what if God goes back and tells her something back under that she knows whether it's the truth or not? That would be the truth. That would make it right. Would that be right, lady? That's right. All right. Now, may the Lord grant it. How many of you will believe if he'll do this to this woman right here? Remember, Christians, pray for me. I'm standing here in the name of the one you love, and I love, Jesus Christ. And if God keeps this promise, he keeps all promises. Now you're here for some cause. I know not. God does. The woman wants me to pray for for a severe nervous condition she had. She gets real gloomy spells that comes on her. And especially in the late part of the day, she gets real weak. That's true. Also, you have something wrong with your throat that you want me to pray for. You're aware that something's near you, aren't you? Your brother would make you feel like that. Right between me and you stands that light that you've seen on that picture. You're not from this country. You're from another country. And you're praying for somebody that's there. And that's a, an elderly man. It's your father. And he's got something wrong with his breathing. That's right. And that's in Maryland, isn't it? You return. God give you the desire of your heart in the name of his son, Jesus. Are you convinced that the Lord Jesus lives and reigns? You say, Brother Branham, what is that? Yielding yourself. It's yielding to the Holy Ghost. You that's sick and afflicted, yield yourself to the Holy Ghost to believe. See? Just yield. Now, out there, are you believing? Are you praying? Now, the lady here, we're strangers to each other, are we, sister dear? We are. Well, we were born years apart, but... God knows us both. Now, just a moment. I see the looks of a woman. She's gray-headed. She's praying. Can't you see that? Look here. Right there. The lady's sitting right there looking right at me, kind of gray-headed. She's right beyond the woman with the black hair there. She's about three in the row. She's got a little checkered collar on. She's a praying because she has heart trouble, and she wants God to heal her. That's exactly the truth. Do you believe it, lady, that God will make you well? You accept it? All right. Raise up your hand. All right. Your heart trouble's left you now. You touched something, didn't you? All right. It wasn't me. You're 40 feet away from me. But you touched the high priest. Simple, childlike faith to believe. Be reverent now. Just believe with all your heart. We're strangers, you said, to each other. 
If the Lord God will reveal to me, my sister, what you're here for. I got an old mother at home tonight praying for me. When I see anyone that's probably been a mother and aged, my heart just goes out. You are suffering also with a nervous condition. But that's not the kind of nervousness. It's your uh, is a weary about something. It's not a, a nervous just like shaky, but you're worrying about something. You're nervous. And you also your eyes is being getting worse. They're going out like they're going blind. And you might know to me to be God's servant. You're suffering with a bad cold right now also. That's thus saith the Lord. Those things are true, aren't they? If that is, would you just raise up your hand so the people can see? Now, do you believe? Now watch. There's something with the woman. She's worried about something. And if God will reveal what she's worried, I can pass her on now. Because I believe she's going to get what she asked for. That what her trouble was, I don't know until I hear the tape again. But now, you believe God could reveal what you're upset about? How many believes that he could do it? Now, you just believe me to be God's servant. You do believe I know you do, lady. Now, yes, the woman is worried about a son or grandson it is. And that grandson has demon oppression, just oppressed and upset. And he's not here. He's not even in this country. He's from Ohio. And a city that's got a college at it, which is Chillicothe, Ohio. That's a thus saith the Lord. <laughs> you believe the Lord Jesus that he lives? The Lord God grant to our sister her desire. Amen. God bless you, sister. Give to you the desire of your heart. Are you believing with all your heart now, everyone? Now, I think that's at least three, but let's just a little bit longer. You... All right, bring the next lady. How do you do, young lady? Is this our first time meeting? It is our first time meeting. Do you believe the Lord Jesus has raised from the dead? If the Lord God, what you see him doing, now, you know it has to come through supernatural. Well, it depends on what you think it is. If you think that it's that it's a, it's an evil devil, then you get his reward. If you believe that it's the Lord Jesus according to his promise, what I've been preaching, then you have his reward. I cannot say myself what you would believe. God could tell me. I don't know. I'd just be real reverent. Staying there, holding, wiping on your nose like that. <clears throat> you believe God heals you of that chest trouble? You do? It's over now. You can go home be well. Just do like the little woman. She was sitting there when I said a while ago she had been praying in her heart that God would say to me, let, him, let me speak to her, for she was badly in need. It's a nervous condition. It's got her a congestion here in her chest. That's exactly right. That's right, lady. Hold up your hand. The little lady just sitting there just now, right? That's right. How would I know what she was praying about? I don't know the words she said to God. See? You can't hide from him, you know. He's, he's here. The presence of the Lord. Young lady, if the Lord will reveal to me what you're here for, you will believe me. To be his servant, you believe that Christ is wanting to get to you what you have need of. If I could help you and wouldn't do it, I'd be an awful person. I wouldn't be fit to stand here on what's called a pulpit. I'd be a bad man. But I'm here to help you if I can. And the only way I can help you is by letting the Holy Spirit reveal something to me that will help you to have faith in his finished work. You're suffering with a lady's trouble, a female disorder. That's right. (laughs) 
you believe me to be his servant? You do. You've also been praying here lately for somebody else. And that's a woman. And that's your mother. And she has colitis. And she's not here. And she don't live in this state. She lives in West Virginia. That's thus saith the Lord. Now believe. And you can have what you've asked for. God bless you, sister. We are strangers to each other, I suppose. This is our first time of meeting. You were sure in the meeting last night. But never, this is our first time meeting. I don't know you. That seemed awful close. Just keep on believing. If the Lord God, who raised up his son from the dead, and we're, you believe we're living in the last days, you believe that God promised these things, if that was a sign of the Messiah back there, when our Lord would tell the people what their troubles was and so forth, and where they'd been, or who they was, or something other like that, he promised that those things he did, we'd do also. And that wasn't to be done until the ending of the Gentiles because the Jews and Samaritans had already received it. You believe that he, this is the end time and the sign of the end time? May God help you. If the people can still hear my voice, this woman has something coming on to her which is a stiffness, an arthritis that's bothering her. And I see you're having tremendous pains in your side. You've had an operation had a kidney removed. Oh. That's right. I see the doctor, kind of a heavy set man, one kind of a tall, thin man, and they're taking the kidney. You're not from this city. You're from a place called Elton. Oh. And your name is Maud McDaniel. Oh. Mm -hmm. You believe now with all your heart? Then go on your road and rejoice, and God be merciful to you. Do you believe with all your heart? Just have faith in God. Don't doubt. Do you believe them feet's going to get well, sitting here on the front row? You as one who's touched him a while ago. All right, they're going to be well. Mm. You took off your glasses, sitting there wiping your nose like that. You believe me to be God's servant? You do? You won't help too, don't you? Your trouble's in your shoulders. That's right, raise up your hands, it's all gone. What about you with your hands up next to him there? You believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? You do? Your trouble's with your hands is what you want God to be me pray for. That's right. Now go and receive your healing, all of you. We're strangers to one another. I don't know you. I've never seen you. This is our first time meeting. Something happened. Someone right through here. It's a man sitting right back here. Raise your head up over top of this black-headed man. You're suffering with heart trouble, and you want God to heal you. That's right. You was praying and asking God, just saying, let it be me, Lord. If that's right, raise up your hand. All right, you receive what you ask for. Go on your own. Be well. Amen. Do you believe all of you? With one accord, you believe? Have we had three yet? We had four. All right. All right. Now, be real ever. We got a man on the platform here. Just a moment. Just exactly time. Now you just keep believing there. We don't know what the Holy Spirit might do. Are you convinced? Do you truly believe, friend? I wouldn't come here to deceive you, my friend. What good would it do me? I'm here as your brother. I love you. That's why I come. 
and I love Christ. And Christ sent me here just like God sent him up to Samaria. He didn't know what to do. He was going to Jericho, but he had need to go by Samaria. Why, Father sent him up there. He said, I'll do nothing until the Father shows me. He sent his disciples away. The woman come up. He began to talk to her. Then he found her trouble. I don't know who you are. You're strangers to me. I don't know who you are, but God sent me here. And I just come here and yield myself to his spirit like Christ did then. And he shows me what's your trouble just like then. And that woman run into the city and told everybody she'd come in contact with, Come, isn't this the very Messiah? Well, if that was sign of Messiah, then it's the same today. If he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's the man. I don't know you, sir. Is this our first time meeting? If God will reveal to me what your trouble is, will you accept it as Christ trying to help you? Now, let's just take our time with this man. If the man, women, children in this building... Here, both of us, we've never met before in life. This is our first time. Now, this makes awful weak. You can see how drops of sweat stand out on my hands and so forth. It, this, it just gets so... It looks like now to me that this audience is just becoming milky-like around. What is that? That's your faith doing that. It's the Holy Spirit settling in the building. You see? Oh, what could happen? Oh, if you could just break that little crust. Sir, I see you a much younger man than what you are now, and a doctor shaking his head. He give you up. That's exactly right. You got an inward trouble. That's right. You're scared that it's cancer now. That's true. That's been long ago. How could God go back in years like that and know? You, what you did. You suffer with a, a gland trouble too. And you have a stomach trouble too. That's right. If God will tell me who you are, will you accept now? Because he's right with you now. You know that. You're Mr. Miller. All right. That's right. Now go on your road and rejoice. Be glad. God bless you. Are you believing with all your heart? Look, friends. You're now much farther than you was last night. If I be God's servant and telling you the truth, I'm telling you the truth right now. Right now, every one of you, Christ has raised from the dead, and when he died at Calvary, he stripped the devil of every power he had. See? You are healed now, each one of you. And so, this is true. The very angel who, I, who guides me and says it, right in this building, it's beginning to look kind of a... I, I believe I just quoted it. Don't think I'm beside myself, but there's a great deep anointing in the building right now. I believe if you'll believe what I'm telling you right now to be the truth, it'll settle it. Will you believe it? Will you promise to believe it? What more could he do? See, I can't heal no one. It's his spirit. Not the people in the prayer line. It's the people out there, anywhere. I just look this way and believe and see if God doesn't do it. See, it's the truth. It's God's spirit. Now, I've tried to lay it with the Scripture. God has come and proved that it's the truth. Now, Jesus Christ, God's Son, heals every one of you. Now, there's only one thing to keep you from not having it. That's that little dark shadow between the Milky Way and you. That's right. If we can pray a prayer of faith to make that shadow move, then the Holy Spirit can drop up on you like dew drops of mercy and make every person in your well right now. In Durban, South Africa, amongst raw heathens, when there was, I've seen 25,000 wheelchair cots and stretcher cases healed at one time when just one of these things was done on the platform. 25,000, and the next day, seven big van loads of carts and stretchers and clubs went down the street singing, Only Believe, with thousands of black naked natives walking behind it singing, Only Believe. If those natives who never heard of God before could accept Christ and get that, what about us who are filled with the Holy Ghost and sitting in the presence of God now to see this in this civilized country? God be merciful to us. Let us bow our heads. Let's be sincere. Let every man and woman look to God just now. Eternal and blessed Father, the hour is close. The people has to go over these slick roads. And I thank thee for them. And, oh, God, I'm trying with all that's in me to this loyal group of people 
not to drag out the prayer line, not to drag anything, but to try to tell them the Bible truth. And you've been so kind tonight to come down and vindicate that to be the truth. Your Bible says in Hebrews 11, God vindicates or testifies of his gifts. Now, Lord, let the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead move into every person in divine presence. And I condemn any devil or any power of unbelief that would try to hold this great universal blessing from these people tonight. I condemn the enemy in Jesus Christ's name. Satan, leave this place. Come out of this people and let the Holy Ghost fall in a great rush of a sheet of blessings upon the people and fill each one and heal them in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe me to be God's servant and I found grace in your sight, I don't care what's wrong with you. Stand on your feet and give him praise for your healing and you shall have it right now. In the name of Jesus.